Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode from the Krebs Coho Channel. It is 11.32, Monday morning, 14th November, 2011. For all of you who are watching today, we're going to be doing a very, very exciting episode for all of you to watch today. It's going to be a 3v3, a 3v3 on Red Bull Express. Yes, indeed, it is going to be a 3v3. We have not done this map in ages now. I believe it's been something like 30, 40 maybe episodes since we last done Red Bull Express. I'm sure you fans actually know better than me. I'm very actually taken back and shocked sometimes how much uh, you fans actually know more about my cast than I know about them. It's absolutely stupendous and amazing, and I think I actually pre really appreciate that. It does make sense. A lot of times I'll listen to the radio and I know more about the caster than, or the commentator than they actually know about themselves. Right, so today we're going to be looking at a 3v3. Right. We're at the 7 second mark, I know very awkward but I missed the 5 second mark, and we're going to be counting on to 10. So we're going to be starting in 3 seconds, okay, 7 second mark, are you guys ready? Yep, okay, so 3 seconds, 3, 2, 1, and go, 8, 9, and 10. Alright, and on we go to another matchup in the Company of Heroes Battlefield. Right, so basically what we're going to be looking at today is a 3v3 of, well, a vanilla matchup. It's going to be Vervmok versus Americans. Now, this is actually the second time I'm recording this game today. And, well, I, I told you guys, it's, uh, well, you know, you might be asking me, how is it the second time when it's still morning there? Well, this is this was uh, morning morning that I recorded the game earlier today that I didn't like. Now, I know it's still morning here. It's, what, 11.33 now? Um, but I recorded it morning morning as since uh, when I actually woke up, but I didn't actually like it, okay? Uh, you know you know what happens when people wake up, they sound groggy, and you know, they might have tongue twisters, and they might not, you know, sound perfect, and so I watched a few minutes of the done replay, and I just wasn't happy with it, so I'm actually doing this a second time for you guys today, because I like to scrutinize myself. If I don't like the quality of a replay, I'm not going to release it, because I don't think you guys deserve it. You guys aren't going to like, enjoy uh, watching just a sort of crummy cast about... You know, just me having tongue twisters and stuff like that. So I'd rather just do this all over again and uh, release some, well, release some quality for you guys, just for you guys to enjoy. Right, so let's get on to the replay. St <laughs> Shut up, monkey, and start talking about the game. Right, so we're going to be looking at three Vermox, okay? So one goes by the name of Epsilon Seb, one goes by the name of Insane Move, and the final goes by the name of Insane Angela Merkel. So all of you Germans should know who Angela Merkel is. All of you Americans probably don't know where Germany is. Haha! <laughs> I know I'm just making a bit of harsh theoretical jokes here, but to be fair, you guys don't know this about me, but I used to live in America before I moved here to Scotland. Um, and to be honest, this was when I was going to at high school, okay? I was going to high school in America, and I'll be honest with you guys, I didn't actually know where Scotland was. I actually thought Scotland was part of mainland Europe, and that actually just goes to show how ignorant some Americans can be, and it's not, it's not, a, it's not something that's only restricted to myself. It's actually common with a lot of people there, and it's simply because, well, we actually were never taught world history. We learned about American history and all that stuff. We weren't taught about world, uh, world history or uh, world history geography or anything like that. It was just always about America, always, always about America, and it's kind of um, sad in a way, to be honest, guys. Um, so, yeah, that is all the Vermont that we're going to be looking at today. The Americans go by, well, the Americans go by the name of Oasis as one of them, Epsilon Contador as another, and we have the National as final one, or Rocky, better known as on the uh, Game Replays forum. He also has an account called Rocky as well. So we got a bunch of action going all along the center, but let's actually focus on what Red Bull Express looks like. Uh, you can already see some stuff happening, some guys going down, various different things. It looks like MG42 just went down HMG. Don't want to let you guys miss the action. But let's switch on over to the tactical map, and here we go. This is the tactical map. Now, this is Red Bull Express. You can see over here that in the corners, you got a plus five munitions point or low munitions point or uh, fuel point, sorry. And you got a medium munitions point over here, and that's symmetrical just on the opposite sides of, well, the opposite side. Over in the center, you've actually got quite a bit of fuel points, okay? You've actually got five in total. You've got three right in the heart and one on each uh, side of mm, the opponents, I suppose you could say. And you've also got flanking on the sides of the center, you've got uh, medium munitions point, one on each side, okay? Now, this is actually quite an interesting map because, well, you can sort of divide those positions or these sectors into three. 
because you have the sides, you have one sector here, and then you've got the middle, and then you've got this side over here. Uh, they're all separated by hedgerows. Now, that's actually sort of interesting because, well, like I said, you could sort of divide it like um, into sectors, into pieces, so three different slices of cake. But, you know, there's a lot of different ways to approach this map. Now, I've actually mentioned this in a previous cast, or a previous cast on this map, that a good strategy for this map is actually to do two middle, one on the side. Okay? Now, let's think about that a lot. Uh, think that about that uh, a bit. Now, a lot of times when people play this map, or from my experience anyway, is that people will actually go all their own way. One will go on the side, one will go center, one will go on the other side as well. Now that's a totally viable strategy, you can do that, however a nice thing to actually keep in mind is wouldn't you rather actually have an advantage of holding a sector rather than trying to fight for it? Because if everyone goes for a separate side you're not actually really guaranteed to have that side. Now if two people go on one side uh, then you can pretty much guarantee you're gonna have that side. Now two mid, uh, two people go in the middle, that is very important, okay? Now would you rather control both sides where the munitions points are or would you rather control the center? Um, and, uh, and one munitions points. Now that's a sort of funny thing to talk about because it's it's even if you have munition, munitions, and your opponent has all the fuels, then that's going to be really important for them because they're going to win that uh, fuel race. So make sure that you actually have two people go in the center, capture that fuel because as I stress in a lot of games and a lot of these replays, I say like to say that it's a fuel race. Okay, so whoever can have the most fuel can always get that teching out faster, they can bring out vehicles and stuff like that, and so they could uh, potentially win the game like that. So go two, mid, two into the middle, capture that point, then one on the side to actually capture a munitions point. Okay, so that way hopefully you, what you'll have in the end is the center with all the fuels and at least one of the munitions points. Even if you don't capture both munitions points, uh, it kind of sucks, but... You know, I think the uh, middle fuel is much, much more important, to be honest. Okay, so that is a good strategy to go by. So the right hand side is pretty much in the Vermont hands at the moment. Observation post going down, 200 manpower. We've also got a uh, bunker coming down, 150 manpower. So a lot of investment of manpower at the moment. Um, lots and lots and lots, <laughs> because that's 350 in total. Uh, quite a bit of infantry over here, motorbike up front, but nothing really much to say on the right hand side, pretty much in the hands of the Wehrmacht, whilst the center is pretty much, well, in the hands of the Americans, which is not too good, because the Americans really do like to get their stuff out fast. Love what's going on here, mine preventing these guys from coming around the backside of the uh, Wehrmacht at the moment, just preventing them from flanking them. Okay, so the engineers just trying to move up along the back, I'm guessing, to maybe flank these guys. I guess he's just trying to set up some sort of attack, but you can already tell that the Wehrmacht know what's happening here. They've got motorbikes repositioning, they've also got sniper right there coming into uh, the spot. I have no idea what these engineers are even trying to do, because they're going to get absolutely owned. And yeah, they are, they're just retreating, but probably going to take quite a bit of flag here if they're going to be retreating right in the midst of guys. Uh, not too bad, actually, not too bad, not too shabby. Not too shabby if I say so myself, but uh, definitely didn't really understand what, what that was meant to be. I mean, the Vermont are definitely smart people. I mean, all these people are really good. Now, let's take a quick look at the names. I mean, look at these names right here. If you're new to the game, obviously you won't know who they are, but take my word, they're very good players. They're highly ranked in the leaderboards, all experts indeed. Uh, I'm not too sure about Insane Move, I haven't really seen him around, but I'm sure he's actually really good if he's going to be playing amongst all of these people. I mean, why would Seb and um, Angela Merkel play for newbie against all these other people? No idea. So they're all, they all are definitely really good people. Okay, so we've got the snipers, two snipers out from the Americans who are trying to take out some of the MGs. Actually, he managed to kill one of the gentlemen here, but we've got a motorbike which is trying to chase down this one sniper. Run! Run, you man! Run! And one going down, one sniper falling down. 340 manpower just gone like that. A snap of your fingers. Can you hear it, guys? A snap of your fingers and the sniper is gone. But this motorbike... So low on health, still chasing down the sniper. I don't agree with it. Why is he doing it? Just about to be met by a bunch of engineers and also a MG nest. You look at this guy. Oh, he's by himself. <laughs> wow, that was actually a motorbike for real. That was very cool looking. Just all by himself without the actual attachment on the side of the side wagon, whatever you call them. Um... I can't actually agree what the Vermont on there. Okay, now this is what I see in a lot of games. Now people, say if the American has two snipers and you kill one of them, sometimes you get a bit bold and you think, oh hey, I'll go uh, try and uh, chase down that second sniper and kill him off. 
Um, even if I have to sacrifice my motorcycle going into the base, whatever, I'll try and kill him. Usually that is a bad idea. From an experience about 9 times out of 10, this is uh, statistically proven. No, it's not. But I, I would say about 9 times out of 10 is a bad idea when you're trying to chase down Sniper into the enemy base. Unless they don't have any MG nests, unless they hardly have any guys in their base. But really, how many times is it going to be like that? Probably none. Um, so it's probably a bad idea to actually, well it is a bad idea to actually chase down a sniper into their base because a lot of times you might get too cocky and you'll just lose that motorbike for, well nothing, I mean that's what happened right there, losing that motorbike absolutely for nothing. So after you kill one sniper just fall back, if you can't chase him down all the way, if you can't kill him all the way to his base then just fall back, no point in actually losing that motorbike and losing all that manpower. Alright, so a lot of confrontations in the center. We've got engineers picking up the MG42 here, preventing the uh, Vermont from actually getting it on back. They've already got an MG, HMG over here, but what are the Americans doing? I have absolutely no clue. This is such a bad position. I have actually no idea what they're doing. Is it going to go down? Whoa, I'd like to see a sniper maybe take him out, but I think the sniper's being a bit cautious because there's other snipers on the field. Man, I'm picking up this guy. Oh my god, there's so much going on. Uh, right hand side is taking a bit of flak because we've got this uh, bunker right here, but it looks like the uh, flamethrowers are just on the side, just, literally, just out of the range of the bunker, and they cannot, the bunker cannot hit these guys, but what are they doing, what are they doing, no, what are you doing, you were just outside of the range, and they accidentally crawled back in the range, they need to get on the side, they could actually have done some damage there if they got on the side, now we've got a, uh, armored car over here, so let's take a quick look at what is in the base, at the moment, actually, something about to happen here. We've got Angela McCarroll with a Goliath and a enemy armored car from Oasis. Now, I'll tell you guys what's happening in just a moment, but we've got that Goliath right over here and the... Oh, oh my god. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. The MH is going down like nothing. Now, that was uh, a very stupendous thing to see there. Uh, basically, the enemy armored car without armored skirts or armored plates just yet just destroyed in one shot from Goliath. That is definitely a uh, Goliath will spend 125 munitions to stop this sort of fast um, teching by the Americans. Now, let's actually see what the Americans have at the moment. We see a Sherman out. The Oasis has gone for the motor pool. He's got bars out at the moment. So, obviously having that fuel. Now, I'll talk about that actually in a second. We've also got Epsilon Condor with a WSC up to Tank Depot. And we've also got the National just at Barracks. Alright, so the Sherman's actually taking a bit of flak here. Uh, looks like it crashed on a mine. But what I was going to say is that just combining arms and uh, having some sort of synergistic effect. So I know a lot of you experts already know how this works, but for the people, the new people out there, basically a lot of times when you're playing a team game, it's a good idea to actually uh, work in synergy with your teammates. So say if you're both Americans, one of you goes for uh, barracks. Now the things in the barracks, the upgrades actually cost quite a bit of fuel, such as the bars that cost a lot of fuel, and even the grenades and the stickies cost a tiny fraction, a tiny bit, but still it is quite a bit. Um, so basically, by having those upgrades, you're not probably going to tech to the motor pool and get a fast M8 or tank depot or whatever as quick as somebody who goes for WSC. Because WSC, you don't have to spend on any upgrades, so you can actually tech up to an armored car very, very fast. But what Epsilon called door, the person who's gotten the WSC, has actually done, he's actually gone for a tank depot. Now that's actually quite funny, he's actually gone for a tank depot. Also, an allied war machine was cold down on top of the Sherman, but it looks like it's going to be wearing away. And we've got a pack at the very back that's shooting at it. But basically, the fuel control of the Americans has been in the center for so long. They've maintained these points for so long that it looks like Condor actually skipped the motor pool and actually gone straight on up to the, um, well, tank depot. And he's skipping it right on up to that. Very good to be seen that. And he's gotten that Sherman out, but um, not so good when it's actually dead. So, what's actually another great point to make is uh, whenever people use the armor doctrine, uh, the Allied War Machine anyway, Basically, there's two things that you can do. Sometimes you'll be in such a desperate situation that you have to destroy the tanks right there. I mean, you have to. There's no other way or you also you'll just die and lose right away. Um, obviously, that's a bit unfortunate because they can get up to two tanks uh, back for free immediately. However, the other thing you can do is also wait for Allied War Machine to, well, be wear away. Basically, that means two things. And <laughs> basically, that means two things by, well, they waste their munitions and they also don't get any free tags. So basically, they spent all that munitions. It's very, very costly ability. Um, they wasted all that munitions just to get zero tanks out of it. So that's really, really good to actually see 
uh, do something like that. Just wait until their allied war machine is gone. Lots of infantry over here, uh, quite a bit of a skirmish, but still that art, the half track, I'm not exactly sure what the Vermont are playing at by thinking they could actually win this. Um, they've got veterancy too, so that's good. However, that half track is right there. At least there's a pack at the back that's trying to uh, prevent that half track from having some usefulness. So, okay, at least the Vermont know what they're doing a bit, at least they have that pack there or else I don't know what they would be playing at, <laughs> that would be quite an iffy thing to be doing. I'd like to see the Stuck actually get on up and kill some of these guys, come on Stuck! Maybe this Stuck go on in the middle of them, crush some of these guys, crush some of them, there's like three of them sticking together right there. We've got a trio of Siamese twins. Um, oh god, just quite a few bodies on the ground. So let's uh, go see what the Vermont are actually doing at the moment, we've got something coming down here, is that a Naval Verfer maybe? Yeah, it looks like a neighbor Vorfer, so we've got neighbor Vorfer out. So let's actually go take a look at the Vermont buildings at the moment. So we've got Epsilon Seb jumping from T1, T3, we've got uh, duh, 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 Insane Move T1, T3, and we've got Insane Angela Merkel T1 to T2, also with a camp craft center on the side as a supplement to get some veterancy out for the infantry. So it looks like Insane Angela Merkel is actually going for a heavy infantry strategy. Fair enough. Now, switching on over to, let's see, Seb has no Doctrine choice at the moment. Move has gone for Terror Doctrine. Okay, that's why we saw a Firestorm just a tiny bit earlier there, trying to go on top of the Sherman, but missing. So he's gone for Terror Doctrine, he's also gone along the right-hand side, so he's got that Inspired Assault, he's also got up to Firestorm, after that is onto the V1. Okay, and let's see, Ins Insane Angela Mikel has gone for for the Vodland along the left-hand side, or the defense doctrine, should I say. So for the Vodland down to fortify the perimeter, and then on to the Flak 88. Flak 88, indeed. So basically, all these guys are trying to hold the, the center at the moment. Um, Right-hand side still in the hands of the Wehrmacht, center side still in the hands of... Well, I wouldn't really say anyone. It's quite mixed at the moment. This point could be decapped, and then it's kind of no man's land, really. I mean, just all these tanks are waiting. But still, loads and loads of tanks out for the Americans at the moment. I mean, these are quite a few tanks. We've got the Puma, which is taking a bit of flak from the M10. M10 is chasing down the Puma, and Sniper Galore right here. Three snipers, indeed. Just killing these guys like absolutely nothing. Oh my god, three of these Volksgrandeers just laying down on the ground. Not going to be getting up. One of them actually has a Panzerfaust right on, side, on his tummy. Fair enough. Um, going to check what's happening over here. Hmm, not exactly sure. Now, this is actually uh, a difficult position to be in for the Wehrmacht when the Americans have loads of tanks out. I mean, a few M10s. Okay, maybe two M10s, not that uh, hard to deal with, but let's see. Uh, what the Vermont have in terms of anti-tank at the moment. They've only got two stugs and um, da, 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 that's about it. Probably a few packs, one pack. That's about it. Okay, so not really much to deal with the tanks at the moment. I mean, there's three M10s, a Sherman, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay, uh, let's go see what's happening with the Americans and their doctrine choices. We've got Oasis with the Armored Doctrine. All right, we've got the National with, well, the Armored Doctrine. And we've got Epsilon Contador with, well, surprisingly, the Armor Doctrine. <laughs> okay, so all three of them have actually gone for the Armor Doctrine. Now, this is actually going to be a question episode. I should have mentioned this at the beginning of the replay. However, I'm going to ask you guys the question now, and I'm also going to ask you it towards the end of the episode. Uh, basically, you guys know the format now. I'm going to ask you questions every, not every cast, but every other cast, and then I'll be doing feedback in the cast afterwards. So, basically, today's question is going to be, well, let me actually explain it, but basically we have a synergy of three armor doctrines, okay? Synergies of doctrines can be absolutely lethal, except the defensive doctrine, which in my opinion could not be lethal, but three armor doctrines. Now let's think about this, okay? The armor doctrine is actually a very, very useful doctrine for the Americans. Uh, a lot of their abilities can be very well used, such as, let's start off with the first tier of uh, doctrinal abilities. Rapid, Deployment gets your tanks out uh, quite fast. That's okay, fair enough. Uh, it's not absolutely needed. It gets them out a little bit faster, but then you have Raid on the right-hand side. Raid is actually quite useful. It allows your tanks to actually start capturing points. Okay, that becomes a bit of an iffy thing, because say if you're trying to hold a VP point, like the one in the center, and the infantry 
are attacking it, then you can suppress them. But now when a tank is trying to actually, or an armored car for example is trying to, or any sort of vehicle is trying to actually capture that point, well your bulls aren't really going to do that much damage to it, is it? Or suppress it even. Um, so that's a great thing about raid. Now onto the next tier of stuff, you've got field repairs. Field repairs is not as expensive as out of war machine, but field repairs is still a very useful ability. Get your stuff repaired on the field. It becomes a, it's very very effective. Um, it's it's basically you get <laughs> repairs anywhere on the field, and it's absolutely amazing to have. Uh, if you have all your tanks that are badly damaged, for example, just flick that on and there you go. You've got a whole bunch more health, not instantly, but progressively over the next few seconds. So, also, what else do you have? You've also got the Allied War Machine. Very costly ability, you can see right there, 200 manpower or munitions, but still, two free tanks when you're using it. So, one of the worst positions to be in, if say you have your opponent throws a tank rush at you and you have the stuff that is necessary to counter it. Now what can make it a whole lot worse is if they throw an allied war machine. That just makes it a whole nother level of worse. Basically, that uh, tank rush that they have, even though it might be a bit level or you might have a bit of an advantage, just becomes a whole different story because all of a sudden they can get a whole bunch of free tanks and that's the last thing you want. Um, and then on to the next tier, Calliope is very, very useful. They just pummel away at guys and just break up positions uh, volley by volley. That's all you can say about it, really. I mean, it's just such a great tank, uh, such a great artillery barrage to actually soften the enemy lines. Also, you got the Pershing, which is kind of considerable to, like, or comparable to a Tiger in a way. Not as effective as I would say, but they, they're about the same lines of effectiveness. Alright, so what do we have from the fighting that's going on the field? Well, the right-hand side is taking a bit of um, confrontation. It's quite a stalemate, but there we go, the Calliope just firing away. And now this is introducing my question, what is your least favorite doctrine to play against, okay? I'm going to be making this point um, quite shortly, and it's going to make sense, well, quite shortly. But I'm going to be um, saying that my least favorite doctrine and I know I should be doing this in the feedback episode, but my least favorite doctrine is actually to fight against the the armor doctrine. Okay, so that's my question for you guys this cast. What is your least favorite doctrine to play against? Mine is the armor doctrine because it's so damn effective and calliopes are just absolutely a huge, huge nuisance. Now, there's one thing for a howitzer, okay? Howitzers you can actually destroy quite easily because, well, I mean, they're stationary, you can sneak in a sniper, drop some artillery, bang, it's gone. Calliope's a whole different story. They only cost a uh, manpower to afford, 650 in fact, uh, no fuel for them, and they're mobile, okay? And they're still very, very effective. When they come down, when they shoot, they still do a lot of damage to tanks, so tanks still even have to be careful of calliopes, okay? Now, Say if all these people have such a synergistic effect, three of them, three of them. Now you can imagine you have two Calliopes per person, that's six in total. Could you imagine how damn stressful it would be to have six Calliopes? You could literally have a Calliope barrage going on the field at every, all times. And if you just take a look at what's going on here, look at this Calliope barrage. It is the absolute worst nightmare for the defensive doctrine. And now I'm gonna actually gonna say that versing the armor doctrine it actually makes me sick to my stomach, and I don't make, mean it makes me sick to my stomach like I hate the doctrine, but I know what it feels like to actually be up against the Calliope and just how horrid the feeling is of being up against Calliope barrages. Okay, um, I'm actually a bit a ad big advocate of. There, well, there you go, some tanks going down. I'm actually a bit a big advocate of the defensive doctrine. It's actually one of my most favorite doctrines out there. Um, and so I love going for heavy infantry strategies and, you know, uh, combining it with the defensive doctrine and making it very effective for the fall land. But my worst nightmare is not howitzers, it's not anything like that, it's not even strafing runs. My worst nightmare is Calliope's, okay? Because they can actually move around, they're hard to take out, um, and their missiles are very, very effective. I mean, they shoot so many. And basically, when they shoot them right at your infantry, you can bet that your infantry have to retreat right there and then, or else they will be mauled apart. They will be shredded to pieces by a Calliope Barrage. So I know that feeling that the Vermont must go through when they see Calliope Barrages. It's a sickening feeling. It's just, oh god, I know I can bring out tanks, but I know it's going to be so difficult from here on out. It's just going to be really, really difficult. Zombie tank, zombie M10, finally crashing out and being destroyed. Fair enough. Got also a flag here. Now, basically, I would say that the 
defensive doctrine, its worst uh, doctrine to be up against is actually the uh, armored doctrine. Because, well, everything that the defensive doctrine has is pretty much stationary. I mean, look at that. We've got a flag, we've got bunkers, uh, we've got loads of infantry. It's the last thing you want to be up against, all these calliopes. Oh my god, Angela McCrell really has a load of infantry. <laughs> Absolutely loads. Calling down for the fault land right here. Ooh, how much is it, how's it going to survive against a calliope? Uh, actually, not not too shabby. Wow, not too shabby. Uh, Clippy Barrage right on top of the Grenadiers here who had 4th Fault Land on and just surviving a whole lot better than they normally would have. So 4th Fault Land, very very useful ability, very useful. Uh, received accuracy, I believe received damage as well, decreased. So very very useful on that front. Uh, what else is going on? We've got just all the stuff here. So definitely the defensive doctrine's worst nightmare is the armor doctrine. Uh, just all these calliope barrages could easily take out flax. Flax are just sitting ducks, just waiting to be nailed by missiles. So it's a, a very very bad day if you're in that position. But naval verfers coming down every so often from the Vermont. Just over here, you got one. You got one over here as well. And is there another one? Yes. Oh, another two actually. So we've got four naval verfers in total. Hopefully these can do something, but nowhere near as effective as the Calliope's. Uh, naval verfers still do a bit of damage, but nowhere near as many missiles, and also nowhere near as fast as the Calliope's at all. Uh, it's very, very difficult to actually take on Calliope's. I have no idea how to take on Calliope's, to be honest with you guys. There's a variety of things you could do, but the most... <laughs> I don't know. I really don't know. Hitting them with artillery is difficult to do. The only thing you can pretty much do is get beyond their front lines and try and take them out. Okay? But that's going to be difficult to do if, well, the American has a front line and they're just hiding at the back in front of all these tanks. Now, you can just already see all these Calibers just pummeling away at the Vermont. Just absolutely <laughs> annihilating tons of these guys. Destroying naval versus killing guys, taking out the flag. It's going to be very, very costly for the Vermont, especially the... Uh, infantry based one Angela Merkel to actually reinforce all this stuff very very costly costs a lot of manpower to reinforce the one guy doesn't it about 27 manpower that is quite a bit and imagine you have to do this all the time when your squads get killed look at these constant artillery barrages by Calliope's this is what I mean when you got so many Calliope's out in the field how many are there actually one two three do we have a fourth one yes we have a fourth one so four Calliope's in total that just that just goes to show you can have almost a Calliope barrage going, well, pretty much almost all the time. It's just a horrible, uh, horrid, very horrid position to be in. Stug trying to take out this Sherman Calliope. We've also got a V1. Can you guys hear that? We've got a V1 just coming down. Everything is moving. Everyone is moving here right now. Absolutely everyone. And oh no! Missing entirely, not killing anything. Oh no! <laughs> no. <laughs> Let's talk about the uh, V1 quite briefly. The V1, now, it's actually quite easy to predict where people are actually going to drop the V1 on you. There's a variety of places that the V1 could be dropped. Now, a lot of times people aren't actually going to drop the V1 on the front line. So, for example, say the Stug can see the Shermans here, or these guys could, I don't know, see some guys around here or over here, for example. Um, Chances are they're not going to drop a V1 on a single rifleman squad. They're going to try and drop V1s behind your lines where more valuable targets are. Such as these Calliope's, such as the uh, Sherman and Calliope that was over there on that Stug. He knew he was going to be losing that Stug, so he was thinking about dropping a V1 right on top of it to hopefully take out that Sherman and Sherman Calliope right beside it. But valuable targets. It was quite kind of obvious that that was the Stug that was near some very valuable targets and they had sight right there. So kind of obvious where that V1 was going to go, so everyone was moving around. You could you can already see some other Calliope's like the ones over here moving about just because the Vermont had some sight over here. So literally everything was being moved around and really good uh, moves by the Americans to actually do that. Calliope's still wearing away at all these tanks. Look at that. Even if they're taking only, only out like, I don't know, a third of their health per barrage. Still, that is per barrage. It's a, such a nuisance to actually have to repair your tanks all the time. It really does soften up the enemy lines. Um, as you guys can see, the Sherman, the uh, Panther, and Stug has badly damaged engines. No way that they're actually going to uh, be able to survive like this if this keeps on up. Sherman going down, but Matt, that's still not much of a loss. I mean, the Vermont's still taking quite a bit of casualties here, or quite a bit of damage. Um, all these guys are grouped up. This is just sort of asking for a Calliope barrage on top of them. Yep, it looks like it. 
So again, being very predictable. Whenever you're up against Calliope's, you really, really need to separate all your guys out. Flag going down, but all these tanks are so badly damaged. These Calliope's are so damn effective against all these tanks. Four st uh, Stugs out. Actually, and one's actually a stew. So that might mean it's a Blitzkrieg Doctrine. Somebody's got a Blitzkrieg. Yep. It's Seb. So Mr. Weirdo Seb has actually got the um, Blitzkrieg Doctrine. Yep. And he's gone down along the left hand side. He's also gone down along the right hand side. So he's got that manpower blitz. You can start affording loads and loads of vehicles or guys, so on and so forth. You know, yada 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 yada. And the right hand side is being. Um, approached on. Now it's 357 points left for the Wehrmacht and 133 for the Americans at the moment. So the Wehrmacht are definitely in the lead here but the v Americans have such a powerful army of Calliope's. These Calliope's are really setting the tone of this match just wasting away at all these guys bit by bit. Also Panzer IV out by An Insane Angela Merkel. Uh, usually when people go for Panzer IVs they're trying to keep in between a Panther and an Ostvind. Um because Panzer IVs are well they're good against tanks they're good against infantry they're sort of in between the two. Uh, the Ostvind obviously not going to shoot as fast as an Ostvind but you know sort of in between an Ostvind and a Panther in effectiveness. Now also, the Panzer IV, you can you can take it in two ways. Maybe they're trying to go for a balanced sort of tank, but also the Panzer IV is uh, can also be considered like a an early stop on going for tanks. Basically, if you don't have the necessary fuel to go for Panther, you might just stop at a Panzer IV and get something immediately out. So sometimes the Panzer IV can be like an indication for desperateness. Now, say if you're actually um, winning most of the, the map, say if you have a majority of the strategic points and somebody comes out with a Panzer IV, it could mean that technically they actually are a bit desperate. They don't have much fuel at the moment and they just have to produce what they could right there and then. Panzer IV obviously not as effective as a uh, Panther against tanks, so they had to, you know, hypothetically do something. Alright, but Calliope's still wasting away. Calliope's, Calliope's, Calliope's. I'm gonna keep on hitting this point, but just these Calliope's are so insane. M tw uh, M26 Pershing is finally out as well. Doing quite a bit of damage. 16 kills already as a load. A load indeed. Uh, another Manpower Blitz coming out by Epsilon Seb. He's just gonna be mass producing stuff. I wonder how he's actually mass producing. Maybe he's trying to get some vehicles or something. I'm not exactly too sure. But here we go, Allied War Machine down on some of these, uh, on this M10, but it's just literally one shot, one shot. Whoever could get the first shot could win on that uh, tank battle. Oh no, <laughs> not anymore. It looks like uh, the tanks are all grouping up together now and trying to move in on the Wehrmacht. But you can just tell that the Wehrmacht are on the back foot right now because the Americans are being so, so harassive. Those Calliope Barrages are softening up their lines, killing loads of guys. Uh, damaging their tanks. It's so definitely hard to avoid at this point. I mean, you can just see these Calliope barrages just constantly coming down on top of these tanks, just wasting away at the health of these tanks. I mean, the tanks need to get repaired, okay? You gotta invest some uh, pioneers into repairing them, but that's like 120 manpower per squad. You could either use man uh, pioneers or you could get a tank repair depot. A few things to do, but still, either way, it's quite a costly investment because you got to get pioneers out, and you need to uh, basically have those pioneers repairing rather than doing other stuff like laying mines or capturing stuff like that, right? So always an investment. Quite a bit of guys going down. We've had a Sherman go down, a Stug as well, and also a bunch of guys are up here. So <laughs> this is such a difficult position to be in. This is why it's always useful to have a. PE player, a Panzer Leap player on your team because they can do a few things. Say if they went for Tank Story Doctrine or actually Luftwaffe, should I say, uh, they could actually get a Henschel out. And you know, this would be brilliant to call a Henschel right here, just where there's loads and loads of tanks to just kill all these guys. Alternatively, a Henschel may be even good at the back to take out the Calliope's. Always great options, right? Also, the Panzer Elite have a Burgatiger, so it'd be so useful in a position like this where all the Stugs are just falling. You got one, two, three Stugs that are destroyed. It'd be so useful to have a Burgatiger right now. If you could hold the front line right here, just to, uh, make sure all these tanks are back, you could potentially get a Burgatiger out and actually start getting some of these Stugs back out on the field. Uh, sort of raising them from the dead like zombies. 
Got some stuff down here to some engineers that are uh, capping way, but overall it looks like the Vermont are suffering quite a bit in terms of their strategic points. It looks like they've uh, actually lost the sides. Got 90 points left for the Americans. 90 points! Oh my god. That's really not that much. I really... I believe that the uh, Axis probably want to win this by VPs, but going to be a bit difficult at the moment when all three VPs are in the hands of the Americans. 2844 for the Wehrmacht at the moment, and slowly ticking away. Slowly, slowly, slowly! Loads of guys along the sides. These tanks just trying to move in, trying to do as best that they can to take out the Wehrmacht. So, so harassive. Occasionally you'll get these uh, Calliope barrages to supplement the attacks. These thugs are forced to move around, not in necessarily the ways that they want to. They probably don't want to go in certain directions, but they have to because um, the Calliope is just coming down on top of them. It's just so unfortunate. You can just see how the Wehrmacht is struggling right now. So frustrating. Trying to get Pioneers to repair their vehicles, but the uh, snipers that Epsilon Contador has from his WC at the beginning are just still here. Three of them, in fact. One Veteran C3, one Veteran C2, one no, with no Veteran C. Three snipers just killing everything. The Naval Werfers, the... Uh, the pioneers who are trying to repair the tanks, and man, oh man, it's just going to be so difficult for the Wehrmacht. We've got a little ice uh, oasis of green right here, I suppose farmland, you could say. The rest is just scorched earth right on across the map. You can see where the Calliopes have had their effect. We'll just look at that. Look at that. Now, I've also always wanted to try this, but try to imagine doing this game, or playing this game in a Grand Theft Auto perspective. You remember the original Grand Theft Autos, Grand Theft Auto 1 and 2, how it used to be like this, like above the way? Now, imagine playing the game like this. Maybe not. <laughs> Probably not the uh, best way to play. I, th I actually prefer playing like this. In my opinion, it is a better way. I don't actually think anyone plays a game over the head, or actually on the side. It's way too slow. As you guys can see, the frame rates actually cut out a little bit when you uh, turn away like this. And also, it's not really uh, great for controlling your units. So, the Wehrmacht are calling down a V1. We can hear it somewhere. Oh gosh, where is the V1? Where's the V1? Where's the V1? Where's the V1? I'd like to see V1. And there's the V1! Destroying one Calliope. Alright, but still missing quite a bit of guys. Uh, was that a sniper? I don't, I don't think that was a sniper, was it? Uh, one sniper right over here, but that V1, mm, well, at least it took out something. It took out one of the Calliope's. You can see that uh, one of the ma teammates, one of the Americans was saying, Allied War Machine, AD, M, uh, AWM. Probably just trying to tell his teammates to uh, flick it on just because there's a V1 coming down. Not exactly sure what's gonna, where it's going to go, but just in case, throw down an Allied War Machine to get whatever is destroyed back for, for uh, free. But you can tell that the Wehrmacht is so struggling at the moment because there's just so many tanks out on the field. I mean, it's such a hassle. Wehrmacht don't really have that much in terms of uh, fuel at the moment. This point could easily be decapped, I'm sure. Uh, sniper just going down. But uh, this point could be decapped, this point could be decapped, and that would be such a hassle for the Wehrmacht. Wehrmacht at the moment, plus 20 munitions, or uh, plus 20 uh, fuel income rate, which is not that much. Basically, that's going to cost... Uh, take about five minutes, five and a half minutes to get a single panther. That is uh, too long, way, way too long. So definitely not a brilliant position to be in for the Vermont. Um, to have be, well, it's just so difficult, so so difficult. Just losing all their points, getting pushed back slowly. 184 points left for them, but still they're winning in terms of VPs. But it's gonna be, it's so damn difficult when you have such a line of mechanized armor on the field, especially Pershings. Uh, gonna be really, really difficult. You can see that Epsilon Contour, or Epsilon Seb, sorry, he's actually saving up his CP for something from the Blitzkrieg Doctrine that is actually going to be the Tiger because he's got everything else. He's already got everything on the other side. He's also working his way up to the Tiger. Um, so he's just a few fractions away from that Tiger. Hopefully that could do something, but still, two Pershings out on the field. Uh, hmm, I mean, I'm sure even a... Uh, King Tiger would have a hard time dealing with two Pershings. That would be really, really difficult to, uh, to be put against. And this is exactly what I mean about... Well, about uh, facing the Doctrines that are your least favorite, I suppose. <laughs> the synergy of three armor Doctrines is so, so difficult to take on. Um, most especially in the late game. Now, 
let's talk about synergies of other factions. Let's say for the Vermox, for example. Now, synergy of Defensive Doctrine would be absolutely useless. There is no point in having synergy with Defensive Doctrine because, um, well, basically you have lots of infantry, it costs a lot, gonna get mold apart. Um, flax, why would you have a stationary, three stationary flax? Probably pointless. I don't know, maybe a heavy infantry strategy and loads of infantry with panzer tracks and stuff. Fair enough, maybe blobs and stuff like that, maybe it would be nice. Calliope coming down right on top of the base here. But uh, basically, I think if there was supposed to be some sort of synergy with the Vermont, it would definitely have to be either the Blitzkrieg Doctrine or Terror Doctrine. Can you imagine three King Tigers? That would be absolutely insane. Likewise, three Tigers would be a lot to deal with as well. Three King, uh, three King Tigers, oh my gosh, that could just wreck havoc. That would just destroy, pound everything. Um, it probably like two volleys. <laughs> two volleys would destroy a Pershing, I bet. So, yeah, again, Calliope firing away here, but this Tiger taking quite a bit of damage. And Angela Mikel is saying noob mates to, to his, uh, to Epsilon Seb. And insane move. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, they're definitely not noobs. I mean, Seb and move are probably... Well, Seb is definitely a great player. I haven't seen him move in any games, but no doubt he's probably a great player as well. So, you know, I think it's probably just as a joke. Uh... Pershing destroying the tiger and getting an instant veterancy too. Oh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. So you can just tell this is completely falling apart for the Vermox. 61 points left for them and 90 for the Americans. Just totally, totally falling apart. They're trying to get whatever scavenge some sort of munitions that they can from the wrecks as best as they can. Like vultures flying above the sky looking for the wrecks that they can possibly scavenge some sort of munitions from. They are. The Vermox are sort of like scavengers at the moment doing their best as they can to stay in this match, but you can tell that the inevitable is just at hand. You have all of these uh, Pershings and Shermans against a single Stug. A single Stug and no more! Just, oh no, we got another Stug! That is all that is left to take on all that the Americans have now, and you can just tell that this is probably, well, this is the end of the game. Everyone is moving in on the Vermont base, and it's just become a base defense now. Stay in as long as you can. All the Vermont vehicles are destroyed and gone. There's absolutely zero chance. Everything is being captured over here. you just got some persistent Volksgrenadiers who are, I don't even know what they're trying to do, just hide, I suppose. It's become almost like a um, base well, trying to annihilation, just destroying what you can. Now, what we did, I think I failed to mention this, but we have a King Tiger just coming out from insane move. All right, so you'll see up the CP and quite a bit of manpower just to uh, get a King Tiger out. Uh, I actually saved up way too much manpower. You should be trying to get infantry or packs and stuff, but. Oh no, that's the end of the replay. That, but that uh, King Tiger came coming out way too late, way too slow to move until the uh, VPs were going to tick out. All right, so there we go. I hope you guys enjoyed the match. Now, my question for all of you this time around this cast um, is, well, what's your least favorite doctrine to be up against and why? Why do you not like playing against them? Uh, why do you find them difficult? Why do you just not like playing against them? Let me know in the description below. Just leave me a comment and in the next feedback episode I will hopefully mention your message, read it aloud, and tell you guys my thoughts and opinions. Alright, so where could the Vermont have gone better? I have absolutely no clue. I, I think they were doing absolutely okay in the early and mid game, but as soon as the later game came on with the Pershings and the Calliopes especially, it just all went downhill. I think the only thing you could have done differently is probably, well, do, well, I was keep on uh, saying this, but synergy of strategies, uh, doctrinal choices. So if everyone went for King Tigers, then there you go. But how were they supposed to know what the Americans were going to do? Uh, so three King Tigers, for example, would have helped a lot in the situation, but still very, very unfortunate. Anyway, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this uh, replay. And of course, until next time, please answer the question. But of course, until next time, I hope you all have a very, very nice day. Until then, bye-bye.